This past Thursday was Ascension Day. Okay, Ascension Day. And the basic idea of the Ascension is what we actually just read in multiple places in Acts, where after his resurrection, after 40 days, he was lifted up into heaven. That is what is kind of formally, traditionally understood as the Ascension. And we'll get into that a little bit more. But let me just uh, answer the question, where is the Ascension in the story of God. I think it's really important that we frame it into the story because we have to understand that there is a beginning and the end of what we know to be this world, this age, and it's written as a story in the Bible. In the beginning, right? That's the first words of the Bible, in the beginning. So there's a beginning and there will come an end of this age and then an infinity of perfect uh, in the perfect kingdom of God. So we need to know where the ascension is in the story because the ascension is like chapter 19 out of chapter 20. <laughs> of a full, like a chapter 20 book, right? So we have to understand what has come before uh, for this to make sense. So let me just quickly go through this, and you can follow along. The triune God, and when I say that, I mean God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, always living and existing as community, um, fully sufficient in himself. The triune God, he made the world, and this world was perfect. It was a perfect kingdom with God being king, it was a righteous kingdom with righteous laws, and mankind, men and women, were made in God's own image and likeness to reflect God, to reflect his righteousness over the world and up to himself, up to God. That's what we were made for. But God's people, they sinned, not because God wasn't a good king and they got annoyed with him, but because man and woman wasn't and weren't good representatives of God. They did not take on the kingly mantle to be his representatives on earth, but they decided to be their own kings. They rebelled. So the good king, he judged them with death, and he took his presence away. But he promised immediately to restore and redeem what had been damaged. And I'll just add here too, if you were here last week, you'll remember that we can go through this quick, you know, screening of the story, looking at it very you know, with the propositions of this happened and this happened and this happened, but you have to recognize the emotion put into this. That when God had to banish Adam and Eve out of his presence, out of the garden, it wasn't just, you know, the next thing that had to be done. It was emotional. It was hard. God was grieved to his spirit at the evil of his people that he made in Genesis 6. So just remember that as we go through this. It's easy just to think theologically, but this is very emotional because God's desire is to be with his people forever. So this redemption plan, it began with a people called Israel who would be his chosen and his beloved people who would then lead others into, uh, into reconciliation with God himself. But unfortunately, as we know all too well, Israel suffered much because of her incessant rebellion. They couldn't be the people God called them to be. But it was to the same Israel that God, by his grace, made some amazing promises and covenants with them about what he would do to restore them and the whole world. And part of this promise and his promises was to send them a king, a messiah, who would lead them as a people into triumph, into righteousness, into righteous living. And God promised to also covenant himself to them in a new way, not in the old way of the law with Moses, which they could not complete and could not accomplish, but in a new covenant, a covenant that would forgive them of all of their sins, all of their rebellion, all of their turning their backs on him, all of that would give them a new heart, because that's the core of the issue, a new heart and a new spirit within them, and also put his spirit within them. Now, behind, behind the veil, what they didn't recognize at the time, but what we have the privilege of knowing because of the word of God, what they didn't recognize at the time was that the Messiah wouldn't be just sort of any ordinary Israelite king descended from David, but he would be the perfect and righteous and holy son of God in power. Yes, he would be a descendant of, da- descendant of David, and Jesus is a descendant of David from the line of Judah, but he was also the perfect and righteous son of God. And what they also did not see was that this son of God would also be the suffering servant prophesied about in Isaiah who would be crushed for the sins of the people so that they might be forgiven, that Israel and the world might be forgiven. So at the right time, the father sent his son and God the son descended willingly and he wrapped himself in flesh. We read that in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus the Christ stepped on our own dirt. 
He lived a perfect life without sin, and he fulfilled his messianic purpose, which included not just conquering Satan, but suffering for our sins. At the right time, Christ died then for the ungodly. Jesus obediently spilled his perfect, precious blood as the propitiation, which is the word for to be the wrath-bearing sacrifice for the sins of the world, for sins of those who would call upon his name for salvation. Jesus didn't just descend from heaven to earth, but from the earth to the grave, to death, to make way for Israel and all the world to be redeemed. And according to the Father's unwavering and unstoppable will, Jesus ascended from the grave to the earth. He was resurrected. And what does this do? It proves his sacrifice sufficient and that Satan cannot destroy God. His resurrection boasts that neither he, Jesus, nor anyone who joins themselves to him, a.k.a. you and me, we, do no, we no longer have sin and death and Satan as our dominions anymore. That's not our necessary lords anymore, but we are free to live for the Father. But remember, he's descended twice, right? He's descended twice, but he's only ascended once so far at this point in the story. So enter the scene of the ascension, chapter 19 of our, you know, proverbial 20-chapter book. He is not ascended back to heaven, but he does, yet with a slightly different feel. He descended a spirit and wrapped himself in flesh, a 46-chromosome little thing of cells as a human being. That's how he came. But now he is ascending in the flesh to remain in the flesh. We often forget that, but Jesus is in the highest heaven as a man in his physical resurrected body. He will never stop being the God-man that he is. And now... As is our present state, we await his second coming when the perfect kingdom that he established and the salvation that he accomplished at his first coming 2,000 years ago will become fully experienced by everyone who calls on his name and yet will experience it in a totally new heavens and earth where no unrighteousness can survive. And until this second coming, the church has one purpose and that is to continue his messianic ministry, to declare and demonstrate the kingdom of Christ Jesus in their lives, and do that to the ends of the earth. Now, we are fairly good. So that's where the ascension fits. We are really, really good at celebrating three holidays, Christmas, Good Friday, and Easter. And if you understand this, understand this each of those has to do with either a descent or an ascent of Jesus. So Christmas, we celebrate his first descent from heaven to the earth. And then Good Friday, we celebrate his second descent from earth to death, and then we have his first ascension from death to resurrection to life. That's Easter. But what about his second ascension? And I want us to consider the power of the second ascension. And hopefully we can change the course of the modern evangelical church and celebrate Ascension Day as perhaps the greatest of all of them. This past Thursday was specifically the day 40 days. I saw nothing but one person online talk about the ascension. No one talks about it, ever. And I think we need to change that course. Let's pray together. Father, a lot of scripture has been read. Uh, a lot of history has been given. And I just ask, Lord, that we would not be flooded with information uh, and become kind of drowned out and just sort of uh, tune out. Um, I ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would come right now and do a work of revelation. Paul prays for the church of Ephesus, Father, that that, you, that the spirit of revelation and wisdom would come and would enlighten the eyes of their hearts to see. And I ask the same thing, that your Holy Spirit of wisdom and your Holy Spirit of revelation, of revealing what once was not revealed or maybe not revealed in the best way, that that spirit now, your spirit of revelation, would come and reveal to all of us the wonder and the power of the ascended King Jesus Help me help all of us in hearing and doing this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I want us to ask the question, why did Jesus ascend into 
heaven. Well, let's quickly first establish once more, maybe if we dozed off in the reading of the scripture, that he actually did ascend. If you look back at Acts chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, look at it. It says this, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up. He was taken up. Okay, so this is after the resurrection, 40 days after he went up. If you go down to verses 9 through 11, we read, And when he had said these things as they were looking on, so this is very physical, he was lifted up and a cloud, this is not mystical, this is not spiritual, this is very real, like there's clouds in the sky today. Okay, he was lifted up and a cloud, until a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, and when you read heaven, most of the time in scripture, it's just talking about what we see from earth looking up. That's heaven. The space, the skies, that's heaven. So as they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? That's where their eyeballs are, looking up where he went. This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. I don't know if you follow NASA or SpaceX, but they're constantly putting up these rockets, it seems like, and they videotape them so you can watch them. And if you've, if you've watched this, you'll know. At the beginning, the camera is like 4K, it's super good quality, but then as the camera follows it, it just slowly becomes more and more blurry until you just see this flame, and then it just goes off. And sometimes a cloud just causes it to disappear. In the very same way, Jesus was taken up like a rocket um, up into heaven. And his apostles were up there gazing at him until they could see him no more. What a sight. What an incredible sight that would have been. If we jump to verses 21 to 22, we read about Peter talking about having to uh, uh, replace Judas. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. So notice now, Peter is using the ascension as sort of a bookends. From the moment that the Spirit descended and kind of sparked the ministry of Jesus, all the way till the Spirit ascended Jesus back. The Father took Jesus up. That's the bookends that Peter was thinking about. Resurrection is not the bookends. But it's like the ascension is in Peter's mind. And someone has to have been with us from that point all the way, not just to the resurrection, but to the ascension in order to be part of the special 12 apostles, which reflects the 12 uh, tribes uh, of Israel. If you go to Acts chapter 2 now in verse 34, we have Peter deep in his argument, which we went through, saying, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, and then he quotes that Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The idea here is that it wasn't David who ascended, but Jesus who ascended. So Peter's making the point. Jesus ascended. He went up. He's not here. And, you know, this is very important. Because we don't emphasize the ascension, but only the resurrection, oftentimes when we speak about the presence of Jesus, we forget that he, as a actual bodily resurrected man is not here. Now, it is true that Jesus is here. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm not denying that whatsoever. And it's true, like if you go later on in Acts, Paul himself says, you know, when he was struggling one time in Corinth, it says, the Lord stood beside me, he said, and spoke to me. So yes, it's true that the Lord is with us, his presence, but it is mediated through the Holy Spirit, called the Spirit of Jesus. That's not necessarily the Spirit uh, that, you know, Jesus is, you know, lowercase s spirit, but the same Holy Spirit that, that revived and gave Jesus everything that he needed as a man. That same Spirit is now with us, mediating the words of Jesus to us. But Jesus is not here. And that's a very good thing, as we're going to come to see. It's so good that right now Jesus is not here, and it is so good that one day he's going to come back. So I think it's just important that we recognize that. He is not here. Now, I'm going to give two reasons for his ascension. Not that these are the only two, but these are the two that I can see clearly, at least in these first two uh, chapters and elsewhere. Both of these reasons, uh, the roots of these reasons, can be found in Acts chapter 2, verses 32 to 36. I'm going to read that again, and then we'll jump into the two reasons. So this is at the end of Peter's first sermon on Pentecost. He says, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. And being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. 
For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Reason number one, why did Jesus ascend? Jesus ascended because God the Father joyfully exalted him to be at his right hand. That's the first reason. Jesus ascended because God the Father exalted him to be at his right hand. The Father raised Jesus up, not just from death to earth again, but from the earth to the highest heaven. And this ascension of Jesus going up, this being lifted up, this raising up, being taken up, these are the words used, is based on the Father exalting his Son. Exalting his Son. To be exalted is to be lifted up by another. When you exalt someone, you are raising them up. And this is what the Father did to his Son. It's based on honor and power and authority. And the thing, the question we have to ask is, okay, Jesus was exalted, but why? Why, why, why? Now, right now, Brittany and I are suppressing that question in our home with our toddler. Why? And we shouldn't, though, because I never want to suppress that question to the point where they never ask why. Why is probably the most important question that we can ask to understand the Word of God. It's the best question that we can ask in Bible study. Why? And God loves to answer those questions. More than Brittany and I love to answer that question. Uh, it's a very practical question. You know, I'm, I'm hoping she asks why when her friends start to pressure her into things that she doesn't want to do when she's older. I hope she asks why when to, our, to us when she starts having kids and, you know, all of these different things. Um, and I hope she asks why when she reads in the scripture. So we're going to ask why. Why did the Father joyfully exalt Jesus to his right hand? Well, the answer, I think, is explicitly found in Philippians chapter 2. And if you want to turn there, you can. If you don't want to, that's okay. Philippians chapter 2, let me just read it. Uh, and it's so clearly laid out why... Uh, the Father has exalted Jesus. I'm going to read this and kind of commentate as I go. In Philippians chapter 2, we read this, starting in verse 6, talking about Jesus Christ. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now stop there for a moment. Jesus wasn't just in the form of God, like as if he, it's not, he wasn't really just in the form. He, he was. He's equal with God. In fact, we're going to read that. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Um, so he was equal with God, but he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now, this word in the Greek means he didn't seize upon it. He didn't take advantage of it. And what I understand this to mean, and what many understand this to mean, is that Jesus, when he became, you know, the little embryo, and then became a boy, and then a man, and lived until he was about 33 years old, he never once in his earthly ministry took advantage, seized that reality of being God for his own advantage, for his own privilege of just doing a cool show with his fingers and just doing all this cool son of God things. He never did that. He emptied himself and he became like us and he relied fully on all that the Father said and all that the Father did by the work of the Holy Spirit through him. And he did this so he could be a model for us. So none of you have the, and I've said this many times, none of you can come up to me with the excuse, well, I can't do that because I'm not Jesus. Have you ever, you know, oh, I'm not Jesus. It's the worst excuse in the world. Worst excuse. Jesus lowered himself and emptied himself so that you could be like him. So that you could, he, he became like us, right? He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. He condescended and relied on the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Spirit, so that he could be our uh, model for us. But this is what he did. Even though he was in the form of God, equal with God, he condescended, came down from the throne all the way down into the most humblest place, into the belly of a of a woman in just this nowhere place called Nazareth. So, so humbling. Verse 8, Paul goes on to say, is, say, say, and being found in human form, so went from God to human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, 
even death on a cross. Out of everybody in this world, no one deserved even a paper cut of damage and destruction than Jesus. No one, ever. And yet here is Jesus, knowing by the age of 12 at least, maybe even before that, at the age of 12, as he's in the temple talking with the rabbis, knowing specifically and uniquely that the Father is his Father, knowing that Isaiah chapter 52, 53 exists, knowing that he is to suffer for the sins of the world, that he was going to be crushed for the sins of his people. Jesus, knowing all of this, went humbly and in obedience all the way to Jerusalem to be crushed for the sins of the world. And not even just to death, but even death on a cross, as Paul says, because the cross was a tortuous, um, inhumane, horrible, um, brutal death. Brutal, brutal, brutal. Designed to not sufficiently put someone to death like a gun to the head or a, you know, beheading, but to cause them to face pain for multiple days. It was brutal. And he obediently went to the worst kind of death for us, for obedience of the Father, to redeem mankind. So when you consider that, then notice what Paul says in verse 9. So he says that, found in human form, humbled himself, even death on a cross. Therefore, what do we read? God has highly exalted him. And he bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That therefore, at the beginning of nine, which is there, it is the key to it all. Why has God the Father joyfully exalted Jesus to his right hand? Because he condescended from the throne, and in humility and obedience, according to the will of the Father, went to the cross and died to fulfill Isaiah 52, 53 and all of Scripture to be the way for salvation for the world. God the Son's humility in the incarnation, his obedient death on the cross for the sins of the world is the reason for the Father's exaltation of him. Consider this, for the Father, the resurrection wasn't enough to honor his Son. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever thought about that? The resurrection wasn't enough to honor his son. He's like, I gotta lift him more, more. Recall the father's words at Jesus' baptism and his transfiguration. I, I actually brought this up last week, if you remember, right? What does he say at these two instances? He said, This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. The Father loves to publicly honor and exalt his son for who he is and what he's done. And when Jesus, his son, obediently went to the cross and suffered for the sins of the world, there was nothing else that the Father could do but not only raise him to life, but to exalt him to the highest place. The Father didn't just exalt Jesus because he was his son. He exalted him because of his work, because of his, 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 his sufficient, sufficient work. I was trying to think of a... Uh, an illustration, um, I, I imagine, let's just say, Primrose in soccer later on in life, and, and uh, I, I'm sitting at the sidelines with all the other parents, and let's say one of her teammates does something really cruel to one of the opposing teammates, and I see Primrose, and I hope this is going to be her, I'll pray this into her, go to the other teammate and help them, come down on her knees and see what happened, and, and put her hand on them and say, is everything okay? Is everything okay? At that moment, I know in my own heart that I'm going to be looking at her and be like, look at my daughter. Look what she's doing. Look at the sacrifice. She's putting every, like all of her other teammates on the line by going to the opposing team and helping them in sacrifice. I'd be looking at the other parents' eyes and saying, can you guys, like, come on, look what my daughter is doing. This is the father, except to an upteenth degree. Look at my son. I'm going to do, exalt him so that everyone can see that I'm so proud of my son and what he has done. This is the idea. Now, where did God the Father exalt him? This is very important. Where did he exalt him? Do you know? To his right hand. To his right hand. 
And I'm going to argue today that that statement is so incredibly important and critical. And I'll prove it with some statistics because some of us still statistics do something to us, whereas others it doesn't. But I think there's still something to say about statistics. Six out of the nine authors of all 27 books of the New Testament, okay, I've probably lost already some of you. Okay, let's try this again. 27 books in the New Testament, okay, 27. Nine authors wrote all of them. So Paul wrote multiple, Peter, John wrote multiple different ones, Luke wrote two at least. So we can see nine authors wrote 27 books. Out of six of those authors, so more than half of them, they 21 times made sure that we understood that Jesus is right now at the right hand of the Father. And the reason why I bring this up, 21 times across the whole New Testament, the reason I bring this up is because this wasn't just Peter's hobby horse. Like, he loved to say it, but everyone else was like, ah, yeah, whatever. Like, this was across six out of the nine of them. This was then, in the early church, something that they knew. The church knew exactly where he was. If, and I'll just, I'll just, this isn't a guilt trip, but if someone came up to you today, before the sermon, and said, where is Jesus right now? Or where is Jesus? I mean, I'm sure you might get a lot of different things. Oh, he's here, or he's there. And a lot of those are true. But how many would right away say he's at the right hand of the Father? Maybe you would, and that's awesome. But this is where the New Testament believers knew where Jesus was, at the right hand of the Father. And let's ask with Primrose, why? Why? And what does this mean that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father? The place... The place at God the Father's right hand in the highest heaven is the most honoring, powerful, exalted, and authoritative seat that one could ever sit. There is no place higher. There is no seat of greater authority in the world, in all heavens and the earth. F.F. Bruce, some of you might know the name, a very you know, recognized New Testament scholar from the 20th century, he writes that this place is the place of supremacy over the universe, above all things. This is the place that Satan, I can imagine, just salivates over. And where every tyrannical world leader would just ever dream of being. Supremacy over the universe. Oh, this is where Jesus is. I want you to listen carefully to what Paul says about this in Ephesians chapter 1. He says this, God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand. There it is. It's all over the place. You can just, you just keep your ear open for it and you'll see it everywhere. He seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Listen, far above all rule. All authority, all power, all dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet. Listen, it's, and I'm, the, I'm, the, I, I'm guilty of this. It's so easy just to sort of read past this and maybe just give it a little flick of like, oh, cool, you know, he's, he's in charge now. But not to recognize that Paul is taking up lots of real estate on the page. And papyrus back then was not easy to come by sometimes, right? That's why they put all the letters together. Uh, no spaces, like he devoted lots of space here for one point. Some of us just think, oh, he's just kind of going on and on and on. All of these words are very specific. All rule, all authority, all power, all dominion. The point is, as the church of Ephesus is listening to this, they're being like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, I get it. Jesus is above everything, above it all, and ruling over all. We get it. Listen also to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 22. He says, Jesus Christ has gone into heaven and is where? At the right hand of God. And then he adds this, his version of what Paul wrote, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. All given over to him. So what does this mean? What does it mean that God the Father exalted Jesus to be at his right hand above all things and in perfect honor, perfect authority over everything? It means that God the Father, who witnessed the humility and the obedience of his son's sacrifice, sacrificial death for you and for me, and for the whole world, it means that God has displayed, displayed to all the world, all the spiritual world, heavens and the earth, he has displayed uh, to all the world who have eyes to see that Jesus is Lord 
that he is the Christ, that he is leader, and that he is the Savior. He is the redeeming king of the universe. If you look back at verse 36 of our Acts chapter 2, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain, because of the ascension, for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and King, Lord and anointed one. In chapter 5, verse 31, we see Jesus, or we see uh, the apostles saying, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and Savior. He's exalted him. God has lifted him high so that everyone may know for certain this is the Lord, this is the Christ, this is the leader, and this is the Savior. And as king, he sits in the king's place, awaiting now for all of his enemies to be made footstool under his feet, with death being the last one. And this will all finally and fully take place when he returns. So this is the, that's the first reason. Okay? It's simple and yet profound. Why did Jesus ascend to heaven? Not just resurrected to earth, but ascend to heaven. Because the Father had to exalt him to the highest place. Reason number two why Jesus ascended. Jesus ascended so that he might continue his ministry and his rule through his church. Jesus ascended so that Jesus himself might continue his ministry and his rule, his reign, through his church. Now, at first, that comes across as a little bit odd. Like, wouldn't we want him here if he's going to continue his ministry? No. And as we'll come to see, he now works through a mediator, which is us. In Acts chapter 1, verse 1, if you remember, we read this. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Luke did not say, uh, in the first book, I've dealt with all that Jesus did and taught. There's a big difference in the grammar there. Did you, did you catch it? It's not just what he did and taught now, and now we're going to talk about the apostles and what they did and taught. Rather, we read in the first book, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach with the true assumption that it's going to continue on. And he does. The Lord continues on. I'm going to prove it to you, just so you agree with me. Uh, if you go to the last verse of chapter 2, we already read it. Notice what Luke says. He's talking, he's describing the early church after the crazy revival of 3,000 souls. They're all just loving life and loving Jesus. He says, they're praising God and having favor with all the people. And who added to their number day by day those who are being saved? What does it say in your Bible? The Lord. Wait, what? Exactly. The Lord did. The Lord added. And this is after his ascension. And yet the Lord is ministering and ruling through his people, the church. Which I'm going to argue he could not do if the ascension did not happen. Before he ascended, do you remember what he commanded to his disciples? Right before he ascended. He said to wait. Wait for something. I got a gift for you. We read about this in verses 4 and 5 of Acts chapter 1. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with the water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. He said to wait for the Holy Spirit. Why? So they might be empowered for global witness. That they might be empowered for global messianic ministry. Which is what? To declare and demonstrate the kingdom of God and the king of God, which is himself, Jesus. Without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, friends, all of our ministry efforts are absolutely worthless and futile and in vain. Without the Spirit. Then came Pentecost, after what I just read, Pentecost came, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in tangible evidence, which was in tongues. It was like a reversal of Babel. God came down and divided people with different languages in Genesis chapter 11. But now at the outpouring of the Spirit, he's united them with languages. It's a pretty beautiful uh, contrast that takes place here. But he did this, and people reacted, calling them drunk and crazy. And then we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 33, which I've read for, I don't know, the fifth or sixth time already this morning, but it's very important. Peter says, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has now poured out this 
that you yourselves are seeing and hearing, referring to the tongues, referring to the work of the Holy Spirit in declaring the mighty works of God in a very external kind of way. So what we read there in Acts chapter 2, verse 33, is that Jesus received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. And it's very interesting. The Father would not bestow the Spirit on us directly, but would bestow him on us through his Son, their King, our, le- our King, our leader, our Savior. And this emphasizes the fact that our reconciled relationship with the Father is eternally mediated through Jesus, always. Our, our reconciliation with the Father is always with Christ being our mediator, always. Because we couldn't alone come to God. It had to be through Jesus. And even with the pouring out of the Spirit, God the Father gives the Spirit to the Son, and the Son pours it out onto us to emphasize this reality of Jesus always being the connection. And Jesus, in his authority and his reign at the Father's right hand, he freely and authoritatively bestows and pours out the Holy Spirit on his church, empowering them with the same power and presence of God himself that he himself relied on during his earthly messianic ministry. Without receiving the Spirit from the Father at the Father's right hand, and only then being able to authoritatively pour the Spirit out on the church, Jesus had to be ascended. He had to be. Jesus even explicitly says this in John chapter 16, verses 7 through 8. John looks at his disciples and he says, I tell you the truth. Now, everything that Jesus says is truth. But when he says, I tell you the truth, it's like, okay, listen even more carefully. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Slash ascend. For if I do not ascend, the helper, which is another name for the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Sideline, he didn't say I'll send it to you. The Holy Spirit is not just some sort of ambiguous power of God, like the force or something like that. The Holy Spirit is a him. It is the third person of the Trinity, a person. He says, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The Holy Spirit, who the ascended King Jesus has poured out on this church, is the enabling presence and power of God for us, church, for you, for me, to continue his ministry on the earth. And if you remember, and I often go back to this text because I really do think it is foundational for discipleship, Back in Luke chapter 4, when when Jesus is in the the synagogue in Nazareth, and he quotes from Isaiah, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim good news to the poor, to set at liberty the captives, to open the eyes of the blind, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. When he proclaims this, notice that in the same way the Spirit, he recognized the Spirit had to anoint him for his work. Spirit had anointed for his work. So, in the same way that the Spirit anointed Jesus to do his work of declaring, demonstrating the kingdom, we are also thus anointed with the Spirit, just like Filipino was saying earlier, anointed by the Spirit, by the ascended King at God's right hand, to fulfill and continue what he began to do and to teach. Do and teach. Word and deed. Declare, demonstrate the kingdom of God. Again, I'm going to quote from F.F. Bruce who says this. He who had earlier received, speaking of Jesus, he, Jesus, who had earlier received the Spirit for the public discharge of his own messianic ministry, he has now, because of the ascension, received the same Spirit by the Father to impart to his representatives on earth in order that they might continue the ministry which he began. Do you hear it? That's it. And we also just read in John chapter 16, verses 7 through 8, just to elaborate on this ministry that we have been given through the Spirit now by the ascended King. We just read in John chapter 16, verses 7 through 8, that the Spirit would what? Convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Now let me ask us this. It's not a trick question. Maybe a little bit. How does the Holy Spirit, who King Jesus poured down from heaven, do that? It's right there. Us. Through you and through me. Jesus said, I will send him to you. And without skipping a beat, he goes on to say, and he, the Spirit, will convict the world. 
So listen, I think that there is sort of this very Canadian lie. The devil knows the nations and he knows what nations were. Our different schemes will work with different nations. And in our kind of passivity and we don't want to kind of beat around the bush all the time. Uh, so annoying. Uh, but listen, don't believe the lie. Oh, I'll just let the Spirit do that. I'll let the Spirit convict. I'll let the Spirit judge. I'll let this. And the whole time Jesus is saying, the Holy Spirit's going to be sent to do those things through you. Through you. Not like, now listen, see, when I bring this up, and when we bring this up, immediately we think of, you know, Westboro Baptist Church down in the States that says, you know, all fags will go to hell. And that, seriously, this is what the, the things say. And anyone who does this is going to go to hell and they're going to burn and all this stuff. Horrible, horrible, horrible things. So I think whenever I bring this up, that's the maybe impulse that we get to. Like, no way, I can't, I can't even say something like that. I would never even want to. I'm going to let the Spirit do that. If we let that lie sort of permeate in us, then we'll never let the Spirit do His work that Jesus sent Him to do. To convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. In the same way that the Holy Spirit of God affected the Father's will through the obedient Son of God during His ministry, we now fulfill the Father's will by being a vessel for the Holy Spirit to continue the ministry of Jesus, which includes the way that we live and the words that we say. To bring conviction to the world, to, to, to their sin, to what's truly righteous, which is Jesus and the gospel, and to coming judgment. And this is what Peter does to later, I think a King Agrippa, later on in Acts. He discusses at length about Jesus and sin and the coming judgment with a king. That'd be like you sitting down with Justin Trudeau and saying, and this is what's going to happen. All the books are going to be open and you're going to be judged and there's a lake of fire over here. It's like it, we are doing that work. Just like John the Baptist went to Herod and said, what you did by taking your brother's wife was immoral. He's convicting, the Holy Spirit is convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment through us. It's through us. And we're not going to do it in a nasty, arrogant, hateful way. We will do it with the love of Jesus, but also with the truth of Jesus. The love and the truth of Jesus are inseparable. To continue the ministry of Jesus, which is the Father's will for the church, is our purpose. And Jesus himself will look at each one of us on judgment day and either he will say to us in our eyes, well done, good and faithful servant, or he will say, I never knew you. And the reason why he will say, I never knew you was not because, well, we didn't spend time together. That's not what he says. The reason why he will say, I never knew you is because they never did the will of the Father. Listen, to do the ministry of Jesus is essential for us. It's our calling of the church. Some of you have heard of the man, um, Brother Lawrence. He wrote the really, really good little book called The Practice of the Presence of God. He spent, I don't know how long, out in the bush because he thought out there, just with God in solitude would be perfect, but he recognized, and he was honest enough to recognize it, that he wasn't able to do the will of God on his own. He had, because there's 56 love commands, <laughs> Like, how is he going to, like, love other people and bear their burdens if he's just alone all the time? So he came back and gave himself to a monastery. This is back in the 1600s. And he just gave himself to that work and loved others. And he did the will of the Father. He did it. It wasn't just about spending time with him in some sort of mystical solo presence, but it was practical. He did the will of the Father. And therefore, Jesus will look at Brother Lawrence and many of us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Jesus has sent us out to do his will, and that is the Father's will. And in his ascended place at the Father's right hand, he has all authority and power and honor to tell us what to do, to be that mediator between the Father's will and our doing it. And thanks be to God that because of God the Father exalting Jesus, we become fully equipped by the received Holy Spirit for this Work. I'm going to read again from Ephesians 1.20, and I'll read a little bit farther because it's amazing what Paul says. He says, God the Father raised Jesus from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet. Just pause there. Remember, this isn't just, you know, going on and on and on without any purpose. This is very intentional. And then notice what he says. And he gave Jesus as head over all things to the church. To the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
Jesus had to be exalted to the Father's right hand in order to be given as head over all things to us, to the church, so that we, as his body, might effectively and powerfully be his presence here on earth, filling the world with the knowledge of the glory of God. A lot of us spend so much time seeking for, and I'm guilty of this too. No, I shouldn't say guilty. I'm, I, this is what I do too sometimes. Spending so much time like Jesus, wanting to minister, minister to me, Jesus. I need you, I need you, I need you. That's true, and we need that. But could it be that Jesus is also just waiting for us, like, okay, I understand that you need me, and I'm so glad that you need me, and I'm so glad that you come to me, but I need you now to go and be my force of change in this world. I don't want to get caught up in just this self-centeredness, even when it comes to my faith, but begin to be pushed out because Jesus has been given head as head over all things to me, to the church, so that we might fill all in all, not just be filled, but fill all in all in the world until the knowledge of the glory of God permeates the whole earth. So that's the second reason for his ascension church. He ascended because he wanted to continue his ministry, and he would only do that by uh, ascending, continuing the ministry through, through us. So I mentioned that we're pretty good at celebrating the two descents of Jesus, Christmas and Good Friday, very good at that. We're also very good at celebrating the first descent, Easter, and as we should, by the way, I'm not minimizing any of them, obviously. But why not the second ascent? There's two quick reasons for this. Number one is very simple. I just, because we don't emphasize it traditionally in the church. I know Marguerite told me that in South Africa they did, and that's awesome. Uh, I think the Lutherans do and others do. But in mainline Protestant evangelical Christianity in the West, it's just not emphasized. That's one reason. We are conditioned by what tradition is around us. That's one reason. But I want to suggest another reason, maybe under the surface. Christmas highlights the humility and the gentleness of God. It's easy to look at. It's easy to see Jesus as a baby in many ways. Innocent, humble, beautiful, hope. That's what's highlighted. Good Friday, I mean, it is hard to see the pain of Jesus, but it's also easy to see the love of his, him, that he would willingly lay his life down for us. It highlights this grace, this wondrous grace and the justice of God. Easter, my goodness, highlights the victory, the triumph, and the hope that we now have through what Jesus, uh, what God has done in Jesus Christ. Now, we appreciate, we're moved by all of these themes and these things that are highlighted in Christmas, Good Friday, and Easter, and all of them, don't hear me wrong, they require life change, but what about the ascension? What does that highlight? It highlights the exclusive exaltation of Jesus. It highlights the exclusive honor of Jesus and nobody else. It highlights the exclusive authority and power and rule of King Jesus. And when I was thinking about it, I was like, this reality of Jesus having been ascended by God the Father to the highest place above all rule and authority, this doesn't just require life change, it demands one thing from us, and that is our obedience. It demands our obedience. And we don't like doing that. We don't like doing that all the time. And be warned that an age-old temptation for God's people is to sing about his authority on Sundays, to read of his power in theology books, to talk about the fact that Jesus alone rules, but not submit to him. It's easy to sing, it's easy to read, it's easy to talk. It's a different thing to do, to obey does our life prove that we have submitted to the ascended King Jesus and everything? What if the ascended King Jesus, with all power, authority, rule, and honor, what if the ascended King Jesus, who is the head over all things given to us, what if the ascended King Jesus at the Father's right hand is what we as the church most needs to see right now at this particular juncture in her life? I would say yes, I think that's true. The church currently is so divided, in very many cases powerless, complacent, timid in many ways, and I believe very confused, both consciously and unconsciously, with her purpose. 
So therefore, I'll say this, what better solution for the church then to rally under her ascended king and submit to him in full surrender and say, God, whatever you want, we will do because you are our king. We sort of have this love for democracy. Everyone's equal. Everyone gets a say. And perhaps our love for democracy has actually hurt the church and her purpose. The kingdom of God is not a democracy. It is not a democracy. The perfect pre-fall Eden kingdom was not a democracy. And the perfect new heavens and the new earth kingdom of God that will come will not be a democracy. So from the beginning, perfection to the end, glory, no democracy. We rather joyfully submit to one king who is head over all all the perfect monarchy the kingdom of god is a monarchy with the ascended king jesus as the head and until we as his people now citizens of heaven sojourners on the earth in these embassies of the kingdom of god here on earth surrounded by all this other stuff until we see his authority as the king and come under his rule and his reign as his spirit-filled and spirit-empowered church, we will not be able to complete our mission nor experience the fulfillment of who God made us to be. So I want us to pray now before we sing. I know it's 12. I want us to pray and ask the spirit to show us with eyes of faith our ascended king, Jesus, because that is who we need. We are heading into tumultuous times and we need the ascended king, Jesus. I'll end with this. Stephen was just a man. He was not an apostle. He was not some amazing figure. He was just a man that we read about in two chapters of Acts. He was chosen to help with clearing tables and giving food to widows. That's what he was chosen for with six other men. And it says that he was full of the Holy Spirit. So he received from the ascended king the gift of the Spirit. And he did mighty works and wonders. And he spoke the truth. He demonstrated and declared the kingdom of God. All of Acts chapter 7 is him declaring the kingdom of God to his enemies. And in Acts chapter 7, or in chapter, yeah, chapter 7, he is persecuted heavily. And he's in his time of probably the greatest need that he's ever experienced. Imagine being in his place. You have these religious leaders picking up big, softball-sized stones ready to stone him to death at this moment of the greatest time of his need being persecuted for declaring and demonstrating the kingdom of god did god show him jesus as a baby no that's not going to help him here did god show him jesus on the cross no he didn't did god show him jesus as a resurrected king on earth no what we read is that god revealed to stephen the ascended King Jesus at the right hand of the Father. That was the vision that God gave to Stephen in his time of greatest need. And might I say that even though we, many of us, have not experienced the same need that Stephen has experienced, one day we will. Maybe it's coming soon. But might I just give to you this challenge that when you experience a lesser need, maybe you need to see the ascended King Jesus with Stephen. Maybe I need to see the ascended King Jesus standing and sitting at the right hand of the Father to give me all that I need because that's what God gave Stephen and Stephen was filled with everything he needed to even look on his accusers and say with Christ, forgive them, they don't know what I'm doing or they don't know what they're doing and he fell asleep and he died. First martyr. The reality is, church, that one day when he returns, all knees will bow because all will see who Jesus truly is. But what is essential now is that we right now see him in faith, and thus submit to him in obedience um, to continue his messianic ministry. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for the ascension. I thank you for what you've taught us today. Uh, it's a lot, Lord. I recognize that today has been a lot, but I pray that you, by your spirit of revelation and wisdom, will have already and continue sh showing us, shown and showing us, the ascended King Jesus, your son that you so joyfully exalted to the highest heaven for us to see. And Jesus, we thank you that that is where you are, that you are at the right hand above all things, and you have now become our head in a very real, tangible way. 
filled us with the Holy Spirit of promise, and now through us continue your rule and your reign and your ministry here on earth to proclaim good news, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to open the eyes of the blind, to set at liberty and free to those that are oppressed, to proclaim the kingdom of God. So Father, Jesus, Spirit, thank you for the ascension. And thank you, Lord, that it, it actually does something for us. Cause our eyes to see and our hearts to believe and our minds to understand and our hands and our feet to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and let's... Uh,